thank you for joining us. Hope you are having a good Wednesday afternoon. Dr. Rogers and I are back. <laughs> Still here. Yeah, we missed everybody. We missed um, educating you and answering your questions. And uh, based on the attendance today, it looks like you missed us too. <laughs> <laughs> we have a really good topic today. It's called Visco Supplementation for uh, Osteoarthritis. Um, this is also otherwise known as gel injection or hyaluronic acid injection. And so I will let Dr. Rogers start. Great. And uh, appreciate those of you uh, taking your time to join us today. If you have friends or colleagues who would like to watch this, we plan to record this and um, post it on our YouTube channel so you can watch it later uh, at uh, your or their convenience. And we are so looking forward to the day when we don't have to do Zoom calls and we can see everybody uh, in person again. And we do uh, anticipate and hope that we will be able, be able to do that um, soon. So, uh, so today's topic, we're talking about knee osteoarthritis, again, uh, specifically um, things to modify um, the contents of the joint, such as visco supplementation. So uh, I'm, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Chris Rogers. I'm founder of uh, San Diego Orthobiologics. Dr. And Rogers, can I interrupt for a minute? Yeah. So for, so for those of you who are uh, joining us for the first time, uh, the way that we do our webinars, we do our presentation, maybe about 15, 20 minutes. There is a, uh, a small Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And if you have any questions at all regarding the topic, feel free to uh, type your answer. Uh, I mean, sorry, your question. You can raise your hand, um, but we may not be able to get to you uh, when you raise your hand. So it's better if you type your question in that Q&A button. And then at the end of our presentation, we're going to go through all the questions um, and we're going to answer all the questions that are related to the topic first. And then if we have time, we'll answer all the other questions. Sorry, Dr. Rogers. No problem. Um, might you want to hit play and then yes. will that change? Yeah, great. Okay. okay, good. And then next slide, please. So there's beautiful Carlsbad coastline. Um, my credentials, I'm board certified physical medicine rehabilitation. I completed my residency in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, and then in 1997, I finished a interventional pain management fellowship program where we learned how to treat the spine uh, without surgery. Uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned, I founded this group here in San Diego Orthobiologics, who took now Dr. Ambach and myself, and we have a new physician who's joining us, Dr. Mariel Diaz, who I think you all like very much. Um, I've been in practice for about 24 years now, uh, and I feel like I'm still learning things every year. Um, so that makes it fun. Uh, and I've taken an interest, as Dr. Rombach has, uh, in what's called regenerative medicine. It's a new field. It wasn't around when we were in medical school or even when we were in residency. It's probably been around for the last 12, 15 years. And that's when I first became interested in this topic of healing yourself by using cells and cell-based um, products that um, have been there all along, turns out. We just had to figure out how to use them as a tool. Next slide. Why don't you go ahead and do your own intro, Dr. Ambach? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Rogers and I have the same specialty. We specialize in physical medicine rehabilitation. I also did the fellowship training in pain medicine and um, another fellowship training in orthobiologics and regenerative medicine, which is um, what our practice is all about. Um, got 13 years of uh, clinical experience uh, doing these procedures. Dr. Rogers and I um, met uh, in a regenerative conferences wherein we teach other physicians on how to do these procedures and we lecture about this topic. That's how we met and um, we have published uh, medical journals and uh, in chap book chapters as well with regards to the topic. So really glad to have joined Dr. Rogers um, in San Diego and so um, hopefully, we can continue to provide um, this care and the, the Regenerative Medicine Center in um, the city. Yeah, in 2022, we continue to stay busy. We've got many projects on the books that we'll tell you about perhaps at another uh, conference. Um, this is our facility. Uh, we built this in 2017, and 
uh, with regenerative medicine, it became aware, I became aware of the need for creating a, a special place that would allow us to do these um, unique and innovative treatments. So we have, um, uh, you see on the lower right, a uh, room where we have uh, specialized equipment for visualizing uh, the areas that we are treating, whether it's the spine or uh, knee or any other, uh, any other part of the body. Um, we have ultrasound on the left and you see the fluoroscopy x-ray, digital x-ray on the right. So that's just sort of our standard tools that we use for um, all our treatments, even our visco supplementation treatments. Next slide, yep. Um, for the cell-based therapies, um, we uh, have this quality assurance department here that um, not only um, has uh, high standards for making things like platelet-rich plasma or bone marrow concentrate or adipose cell products, uh, but we also um, quantify what's in the biologic. We, you see the cell counter on the lower right uh, so that when you receive something, for example, like platelet-rich plasma, we know exactly the dose that we're giving you. We know uh, the quality of that product that we're making for you. Next slide. Okay, so let's get right into it. So we're gonna talk about visco supplementation. This is something that's been around for more than 15 years. I've, I've been injecting uh, uh, this, this particular treatment, for, uh, again, for at least 15 years. Um, we're gonna talk about its role in osteoarthritis, which is its main um, use. Uh, and then we're going to compare it to some of these other treatments that are coming online now, one I already alluded to, PRP or platelet-rich plasma, and then we'll answer your specific questions at the end. We'll try to keep this talking part to about 20, 30 minutes max. Okay, so um, we should never assume that people know what osteoarthritis is. So uh, here I am showing you the anatomy of a joint. It could be any joint. This could be your finger joint, for example. Uh, the joint, every joint, every um, uh, what we call synovial joint is formed by, of course, two bones coming together. Uh, and then at the end of the bone, to cushion the bone is a thin layer of cartilage. We call that articular cartilage. Uh, and unfortunately throughout life, that cartilage will thin and become damaged and flake off and, and, and lead to problems. Uh, but osteoarthritis is much more than that. It's, it's more than just a disease of the cartilage uh, thinning and breaking off. It's also a disease of the rest of the joint and other tissues in the joint include uh, what's called that synovial membrane, that red line that you see surrounding uh, the joint. It's a very thin, very vascular tissue that actually manufact, one of its primary jobs is to manufacture what's called synovial fluid. Synovial fluid is the the liquid in your joint that cushions the joint. It also nourishes the cartilage and it has specific mechanical properties that give it a um, uh, essentially a hydrogel uh, mechanical property to, to allow the joint to be lubricated and, and also for those tissues to be protected and cushioned. Um, and then uh, surrounding the joint is what's called a capsule, it's a fibrous collagen structure that sort of holds everything together. Um, and, and so when you have osteoarthritis, you have damage to the cartilage, you have damage to the bone underneath the cartilage, uh, and then the, you have inflammation. So your immune system, which normally is designed to attack things like bacterial infections or viral infections, uh, will detect damage in the joint. And as part of the natural cleaning up process, so you can imagine little broken pieces of cartilage floating around in your knee, part of the process of cleaning that up, um, the immune system goes in there and starts nibbling away and digesting the debris. But if that activity becomes overzealous, then we would say that's an inflamed knee. That's a knee that has too much inflammation. It has too, um, and that affects the mechanical properties of the joint, and it also affects the mechanical properties of the synovial fluid, uh, thinning it out, reducing its ability to provide a cushion. Uh, and also, of course, it causes pain because now these immune system cells are producing molecules that irritate nerve fibers, giving you knee pain. That's what's keeping you up at night. So next slide. Uh, of course, also one of the other symptoms of knee osteoarthritis is knee stiffness. And uh, so if you're producing too much fluid in reaction to that inflammation, that's where a lot of that stiffness uh, will come from. 
Uh, and people are also familiar with the concept of a Baker's cyst, which is a little ball of fluid behind your knee. That's where that capsule stretches out and forms a little pouch. So these are some of the things you might've heard about with knee osteoarthritis. So to combat the symptoms of knee osteoarthritis, it was recognized that uh, that synovial tissue, that red tissue, that lining of the joint naturally makes synovial fluid, which is rich in something called hyalur hyaluronin or hyaluronin ac hyaluronic acid, uh, which is easier said than done, right? And um, that is a natural substance that's produced by the cells in your knee joint uh, that, as I said, lubricates the cartilage, lubricates the joint, and provides a hydrogel cushion. This molecule, this hyaluronic acid molecule, can absorb about 1,000 times its weight in water. And as a result, you, uh, you know, think of something like toothpaste. That's a hydrogel. That's where you have a molecule that absorbs water. And so that's, uh, that absorption of water uh, creates that cushion. By the way, your cartilage does the same. It absorbs water and it creates this cushion effect. But in osteoarthritis, you have decreased production of hyaluronic acid. You have decreased lubrication, decreased cushioning of the joint. So the thought was, hey, you know, we have this natural occurring molecule. Maybe we can use it as a treatment. And unfortunately for all the chickens in the room, uh, it was discovered to be abundant in the rooster comb, right? So you've, you've, you've known, you've heard that this gel can be derived from the comb of the rooster. It's very rich in this hyaluronic acid. And so the early manufacturers uh, uh, developed a product that was based predominantly from chicken. Uh, unfortunately, some people are allergic to chicken. And so alternative methods had to be developed. It turns out that certain bacteria like strep, you know, anybody who's had a strep throat knows that that bacteria is not very nice. Uh, it happens to have a capsule around it that is made of hyaluronic acid. And so um, bacterial fermentation with strep the cocci uh, was actually shown to be another good way to make hyaluron hyaluronic acid gel. And so as you can imagine, over the next, you know, 10, 15 years, many more products came online. I think there's probably 20, 25 different gels uh, products in the world. Here you see two of them, Duralane and Synvisc. These are some that we use. Um, we like them because uh, there's, there's evidence that shows that the higher um, density, we'll call it, the higher molecular weight of the molecule, the better the results. It hangs around in the joint a little bit longer, um, more so than the low molecular weight products. Uh, there's something called cross-linking. This is kind of getting into the nuts and bolts of how these gels are manufactured. But suffice it to say that um, the, the primary goal is to help the gel hang out in the knee a little bit longer so that it can influence the osteoarthritis. Um, it's not just cushioning the joint. And for years, I was under the impression that that was its sole purpose. And I think some people still think this, that the sole purpose of the gel is to cushion, to create a little pad in your, in your joint and cushion the joint. But if I were to tell you that that gel, after we inject it into your knee, only hangs around for a couple of days, you might wonder how good of a cushion is it actually? And that's the truth. The gel doesn't hang around in your knee more than a couple of days. So what's happening here? What's happening is it's inciting your natural synovial tissue to function better. It encourages it to make hyaluronic acid uh, naturally. It encourages decrease in inflammation of the joint. Uh, there's this, uh, it also helps minimize the degradation of cartilage that occurs with osteoarthritis. So there are some true biologic effects that this molecule can induce into the uh, person's knee uh, with osteoarthritis. The challenge, of course, is that it doesn't last very long. And um, Dr. Ambach will talk about some of the efficacy data uh, and how long some of these treatments might work. But I'm sure many of you have had gel injection uh, in your knee. It's a simple procedure. We do it under ultrasound guidance so we can see that the gel is going into the knee joint, minimizes the discomfort, and it makes it more effective. And as I explained, it's decreasing pain and inflammation. It's helping people um, improve the mobility, possibly by decreasing the swelling in the joint and lubricating the joint. And then, as I said, it stimulates the natural production of hyaluronin. Uh, uh, hyaluronin and hyaluronic acid are used interchangeably, those terms. Um, and uh, so how, how does the treatment typically go? Well, basically, it's an injection. 
it can be repeated. Uh, uh, there, there's a debate as to how many shots is the right number. Um, Dr. Anwath will go over some of that data. Uh, typically, we just do a single injection and then um, patients may get up to six months relief, at which point it can be repeated. Um, we ask the patient after the injection to take it easy for a couple of days, cut your activity level in half. If the knee is swollen or sore, which is a, a not uncommon side effect of any injection for that matter, uh, I'll just share with you, there's, some, there's a really nice study where patients had water, um, what's called normal saline, sterile water injected into their knees. And those patients also had swelling and discomfort for two to three days after their injection. So it's probably the trauma of the needle that causes the discomfort. Some people are sensitive to the preservatives in these products and they will, um, about less than 1% of patients will have a flare in response to these products, um, but it's, it's, it's pretty rare. And like I said, it can provide relief uh, for up to six months in some people. Some people, a handful of my patients are lucky and they'll get a year's relief, but that's not the norm. Um, it doesn't actually reverse osteoarthritis, um, but it does alleviate the pain and dysfunction associated with osteoarthritis for uh, short periods of time. I think this is where you go, Dr. Ambach. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Rogers gave a really good um, description and introduction of what hyaluronic acid is. There's, uh, as I said, there's more than 20 of them out now in the market. There's lots of human clinical trials that has been published for the use of this uh, gel injections or HA injections for osteoarthritis specifically. Um, most of the clinical trials um, are based on knee osteoarthritis. Um, there's probably about 30 hip osteoarthritis clinical trials, and there's less than 10 clinical trials on using it for ankle joint osteoarthritis. And um, we, when you conglomerate all the studies that's out there, and this is one of the studies that basically did a review of all the human clinical trials that has been published, the consensus is this injection is, is relatively safe. Uh, really no uh, adverse effects aside from if you have any allergy to its components. It's very well tolerated injection. Um, it's uh, it's uh, well tolerated and it's safe and it has been effective for mild to moderate osteoarthritis. Um, the relief doesn't come immediately. It's not like cortisone injection where if you get the shot now, you'll feel great the next day or two. With this uh, injection, you'll, you, you won't see the relief until three to four weeks, so about a month after you, you uh, get the injection itself. The functional improvement um, from the injection itself happens even later on, usually about two months. Um, and that's because of you know, the mechanism and how it works, as how uh, Dr. Rogers um, explained. There's still a lot of controversy with regards to how long it lasts and the clinical effectiveness of it. Uh, there's some studies that compared the HA with saline injection and um, it didn't show any significant difference in its benefit. Um, there's also um, some debate on uh, what molecular mass is more effective. Um, there's some gel injections that are uh, that have a bigger molecular mass than um, than uh, other injections, so they call that high molecular weight and low molecular weight uh, HA injections. Um, they have found actually that the biology um, or the the effect of the HA changes as the molecular mass increases. So they have found that when it's low molecular weight, when the mass is, is smaller, that it's more immunologic in its effects, and when it's higher molecular mass, it's more of the viscoelastic effect, so more of the cushioning effect. So there's still debate, you know, which, which one is better. Um, also, with regards to the timing and the duration, there's a lot of different preparations now with these gel injections. Some come in one injection for three weeks, so you get one injection every week and you come uh, weekly. There's some preparations that are five injections. So you come every week times five. And then now the newer preparations are um, the all-in-one shots. So you get one injection um, that is a, a conglomeration of all the shots. And you know they, they have compared is three better than five, better than one, and they haven't really found a consensus on which one is better yet. So um, it's still, 
you know, up in the air which one is best. Um, we do use the, the gel injections that's one shot. Um, we didn't see it to be any different than uh, the prior formulations were in you come in, you know, three times or five times, better tolerated by the patients. Um, and um, with regards to how long it lasts, you know, it's anywhere from, again, it's anywhere from four to six months. Uh, some patients who actually do this repetitively, they find that it lasts shorter and shorter. Like we have patients that have been doing this every every six months, and then they found that it only lasts them now three months or two months. So, um, so there's that effect of it. It doesn't last long. Um, so I just wanted to share, this is one study wherein they had 87 knees that has osteoarthritis in it. They divided these uh, patients into three groups. One group had uh, received the PRP, platelet-rich plasma. The other group received the gel injection, and then another group gave uh, got the placebo or the saline, which is um, uh, water. And so they followed these patients for up to 12 months, and they found at the end of their study that the PRP actually had a more severe effect than the saline um, after uh, as early as one month up to one year, and that the PRP also showed more statistically significant improved uh, than um, baseline, which is before the treatment. So they found that overall the PRP worked the best, better than HA. When they compared HA, the gel injection with the saline, they didn't find any uh, significant difference between this, the water and the saline uh, at one year. And they, with this study, they actually did show any significant improvement uh, after treatment. Again, you know, there's, there's some studies that did show good benefits at four, six months, some studies don't. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different uh, results out there, um, depending on which study you're showing. So there has been inconsistent results. Uh, this is a study that we have published several years, several years ago. This is 105 patients. Um, it's also a randomized controlled uh, multi-center trial, and the patients were divided again into three groups. One group received the gel injection, HA, one group received the PRP injection, and then the third group actually had the combination of um, PRP and HA. So there has been some data that shows that um, the gel itself can be um, synergistic with the platelet-rich plasma, wherein it can provide a, a framework or a scaffold for the, the platelets to adhere to and help with cell signaling um, and uh, uh, the transmission of molecules within the, the EC, what we call the extracellular matrix. So some studies have shown that it could be beneficial. Our results showed that um, the PRP resulted to better pain and function in all the time points uh, when compared to the gel injection up to one year. And then uh, with regards to the combination, uh, what we found was patients who actually had the combination had uh, earlier uh, return to activity uh, and earlier pain relief uh, than patients who just had the, uh, the PRP. So it is more of a short-term relief uh, at about three months, six months, um, the combination group PRP plus HA had the same result as the PRP group. So that uh, the combination effect of it was not sustained for a long time. So it's, you know, it's good for, um, for example, for athletes who wants earlier return to play, you know, it can uh, get them back to activity sooner. Uh, so that's one um, benefit that we have seen uh, from this study. Um, like, there's probably about 20 uh, high quality studies, uh, what we call RCT or randomized controlled clinical trials, which is the gold standard for doing a human clinical trials that show that platelet-rich plasma has superior efficacy um, more than the gel injection and more than saline in treating knee osteoarthritis. And one of them is this study um, wherein it was a systematic review. A systematic review is they get all different kinds of studies, uh, conglomerate them, put them all together, and analyze the results based on the results of each study. So with this one, they actually compiled 20 different randomized clinical trials. So as you can see on the left, these are all the, uh, the clinical trials coming from different countries. Um, 
and uh, there's uh, hundreds of patients that were enrolled in the study. You can see in the second column the number of patients that I enrolled. Um, and then the mean age was about you know, 50s to 60s. And the main findings out of this systematic review that they have found was that when you inject the PRP into the joint, this was more efficacious than hyaluronic acid for knee osteoarthritis. This was a knee study in terms of uh, short-term functional recovery. Um, but they also found that the PRP injection was superior to the gel injection in terms of long pain, uh, long-term pain relief and functional improvement. So more and more uh, data is actually showing that the PRP is a better treatment um, because it lasts longer and it has all the other different benefits um, for the joint that the HA doesn't provide. So for those of you who needs a little refresher on what PRP is, PRP stands for platelet-rich plasma, and it's a concentrated solution of uh, platelet cells, which are found in our blood cells. Um, as you can see on the left here, uh, when we spin your blood, it separates into different cell layers, and the platelet layer is the layer in the middle. And we are interested in the platelets because they have thousands of growth factors. And these growth factors are the ones that are involved in healing and repair. They stimulate all the cells to come to the area of injury to start the repair process. They help in tissue building. They help in formation of blood vessels, which is important for those areas in the joint that doesn't have a lot of blood supply, like your, um, your uh, ligaments, your cartilage, your tendons. Uh, and stimulate healing into that region. Uh, so it is, uh, it's chondroprotective, which means that it protects the cartilage from further degeneration and may even improve it uh, based on what these uh, growth factors do. So um, we, we did have webinars specifically dedicated to PRP itself, like the plasma and its clinical indications. Um, if you haven't seen that webinar, we have a YouTube channel that has all the prior webinars that we had, and you can um, watch all our videos there and learn from that video. Um, but I think that, that ends our lecture. Um, we we uh, use Data Biologics, which is a cloud-based uh, global registry that has been co-founded by Dr. Rogers. And this is a, a registry that we um, used to collect uh, patient data and to track our outcomes um, for many reasons. One, uh, patients want to know what our outcomes are for these procedures. Uh, and this is an objective data that we can present to them to tell them how these procedures have been benefiting our patients. Um, in addition to tracking outcomes, it also helps um, uh, regulators and insurance companies um, hopefully to provide them data to hopefully cover these procedures soon. Um, anything you can add on data biologics, Dr. Rogers? Yeah, it, it was born out of uh, the need that we perceive both physicians and patients having the same question, you know, what works, what doesn't work, what's going to work for me? Should I have one gel injection, two in gel injections, two PRP injections, PRP plus? There's just so many different combinations and we can't expect the scientists at the universities to do you know, the thousands of studies that need to be done. And yet at the same time, we realize that there are thousands of doctors around the United States and world for that matter, doing these treatments with different types of recipes, if you will, different protocols. And so my colleagues, Dr. Malenga and Dr. Bowen and myself realized that if we could just help doctors track their data, we could create this huge database of information that informs everybody. So we're, we're now three years into this project. Um, we're the second largest uh, database in the world for uh, what we call orthobiologics. Um, and uh, we're getting to the point now where we're answering some of these questions. Thank you. And that uh, ends our lecture. Thank you for your time and thanking, thank you for sticking with us. Um, we can now go to the question and answer portion. Yeah. Um, Dr. Rogers, can you see the Q and A? Yeah, I'm uh, just pulling it up now. So yeah, the first question is, uh, will we send everyone a, a link to the YouTube? Uh, if you just go to YouTube and type in SDOMG, you'll find us. Uh, but if you want, we can email you a link as well. That's no problem. Um, there's a good question here. You know, what about other joints? You know, we're talking so much about the knee. 
One, uh, one issue, and I'm not sure I understand the reason for it, but uh, insurance companies and, and, well, let's put it this way. Traditionally, insurance companies would only pay for hyaluronic acid gel injections to be done uh, in the knee joint. And it's probably because there just wasn't enough data on the other joints, whether it's shoulder, hip, ankle, there are, there's data. It's not that there isn't data. It's just that there's a certain amount of data required by insurance companies to feel like it's cost effective and that they want to um, insure it. Unfortunately, after 15 years of pain for some of these therapies, now they're uh, reversing their policies and um, to the point where I think um, maybe half as many insurance companies cover uh, these treatments. So now, so now patients are being forced to pay cash for what used to be covered by insurance. So it's a reversal of policy, um, which makes it important to look at other options that are also not covered by insurance and are possibly more cost effective, such as platelet-rich plasma. The injection of platelet-rich plasma in our office is roughly equivalent to the price of uh, hyaluronic acid if you're paying gas. And so you heard Dr. Ambach say that, you know, maybe you can get a year's relief from platelet-rich plasma versus six months from hyaluronic acid. So the cost effective um, uh, equation becomes very different. And we're finding that patients, unfortunately, are being stuck with paying a lot of these uh, costs themselves. Uh, things are not covered by insurance. This is an increasing trend, not just in orthopedics, but in all of medicine. And so it uh, just speaks to why we need data to help patients and physicians make informed uh, medical decisions. I personally have only treated a handful of patients with shoulder osteoarthritis. I was not satisfied with the results, but I have to be honest and say those patients were tough cases. They were not the mild to moderate arthritis that we're talking about. They were the more severe osteoarthritis. And let's just face it, that's a, that's a more difficult um, uh, condition to treat. Right, uh, and then with regards to your question on the shoulder joint, uh, if you look at all the uh, HA studies, uh, it was more directed for knee, um, ankle, and hip. Uh, there, there's no studies that I can think of for the shoulder. It doesn't mean there's none that was published, but um, you know the biology of what happens inside the joint uh, it is pretty similar uh, in, in all the joints. You've got the you know all the, the the different uh, structures that comprise the joint, which is the same. So um, if it works um, for one joint, most likely it's gonna work um, as well in the other joint, obviously, depending on how severe it is. There's a question here where in um, what indications uh, will hyaluronic acid not work in the knee? And uh, that would be severe osteoarthritis um, because the gel injections are not um, really very effective when, you're, uh, when your arthritis is too far gone. Uh, it's not strong enough to decrease that inflammation to help with the pain uh, and sustain um, the cushioning in the joint. So we would not recommend the HA for uh, severe osteoarthritis. Yeah, and, and to that point, also platelet-rich plasma, although it can be effective in more severe osteoarthritis, it's generally more limited in its duration of effect. Um, I mean, we've had patients who are trying to avoid knee replacement, and we've successfully managed them for years with platelet-rich plasma, or in some cases, also hyaluronic acid. Um, and there's a couple of good studies that have shown that um, in the knee and in the hip that you can delay uh, the onset or need for joint replacement surgery uh, with, with these treatments. Um, I'm going to, um, I want to make sure there's some great questions here I'm looking at that just keep popping up. I'm going to try to answer questions more succinctly so we can get through all of them. Uh, the one question that probably we get most often is the one that's asking about why won't insurance pay for it. We have solid evidence. You heard Dr. Ambach say we have high level, what we call level one evidence, randomized clinical controlled trials showing superiority of hyaluronic or of platelet-rich plasma over hyaluronic acid and over placebo, and, and also, by the way, over steroids. So the, the primary challenge, there's two primary challenges in getting insurance companies to pay for these things. The first thing you have to realize is when it comes to platelet-rich plasma, uh, you could go to any one of 20 orthopedic practices in San Diego and get, one, uh, get 20 different types of platelet-rich plasma, meaning that the way we prepare, the way we centrifuge it, how long we centrifuge it, which part of the platelet fraction we remove, do we combine it with a little plasma or a lot of plasma? We, in our office, 
um, we have different methods for different patients. So um, most clinics don't do this. Most clinics, they'll just have one system. Typically what will happen is a device manufacturer or a company will come into an orthopedic uh, practice and, and sell them a centrifuge and say, okay, now you're doing PRP and now you have to buy kits. It's kind of like when you buy a printer from HP, now you have to buy their ink cartridges every month. So it's the same model. So, so it's, it's um, most orthopedic surgeons don't want to have five or 10 different centrifuges in their office. So they have one centrifuge, they have one system and they use that company's kit, which may be good or may be bad, depending on what that patient's actual needs are. We're learning that different conditions require different types of PRP. And this is what's, what you're seeing in the literature as well. You're seeing that different um, universities, different clinical trials use different recipes. And so this now makes it very difficult for the insurance company to assess what their costs are gonna be, what their risks are gonna be, and what the benefits might be. And so not having standardization in the field is a huge problem. We have standardization in our office. I showed you our cell counter. We do quality assurance. We make sure that, first of all, first of all that you actually are getting a concentrated dose of platelets in that product and that is low or zero red blood cells, that's necessary when you're treating knee osteoarthritis. It may be slightly different for a rotator cuff tendon tear or other type of orthopedic condition. Um, but we also use kit, I've used probably six or seven different uh, centrifuge systems. Uh, they each have their pros and their cons, but, but clearly it's not a one size fits all. And clearly the literature is all over the place um, one final note, there was a very well done study done published in a prominent medical journal, uh, a randomized clinical trial comparing PRP to, to normal saline for tendon injuries in the shoulder, and they showed no effectiveness of the PRP. But when you actually read through that paper, you realize that they did not make PRP. They used a system that is known to be inferior, is known to not concentrate the platelets sufficiently, and therefore it's no surprise that they did not demonstrate superiority over placebo. So um, how that paper got published, I don't know. That should have been screened out by the editors of that journal, but nonetheless, you can be assured that myself and other doctors wrote letters to the editor. Um, but this is the issue with insurance companies and it's gonna to continue to be an issue for the foreseeable future. So much for a succinct right. answer. <laughs> Dr. Amba. <laughs> the six pound and the pros and cons of uh, high molecular weight versus low molecular weight injections. Um, so there's some studies that have shown that if the HA has high molecular weight, which means they have uh, bigger uh, molecules, that they provide more of the viscoelastic uh, property wherein there's more cushioning effect into the knee joint uh, and that it can also last longer. Um, however, there are some studies that have shown that low molecular weight uh, injections, although they have uh, lower molecules, that they do just the same, that there's no significant difference between the two. So there, again, there's really no consensus um, yet with regards to that. Um, the, the studies have been mixed in their responses. The, real, the adverse effects are fairly the same, whether it's high molecular weight or low molecular weight. Um, in our clinic, we use a high molecular weight and cross link, uh, which is uh, the, the, uh, the kind that uh, really lasts long and it's stable molecules. So it gives you a more, um, a more sustained uh, effect. Uh, and then with regards to uh, the PRP and the HA, um, we, yes, we can do it, you know, at the same visit where we do the, uh, the HA and then um, we also uh, add the PRP. Um, in some cases, it's a stage procedure wherein they get the HA first, uh, at least to give them um, the cushioning effect, anti-inflammatory effect, and then they can be followed by a PRP later on. So there's, there's really no um, cookie cutter um, a type of treatment here. It just depends on what the patient needs. Great. Hey guys, I'm so impressed by your sophistication. I'm reading your questions. You folks have been doing your homework. Congratulations, that's awesome. Uh, let's just pile through some of these here. Um, if I have a bruised knee bone and a Baker's cyst, which I told you is a collection of fluid from stretching the capsule behind your knee joint, plus I have osteoporosis, but I wanna stay mobile, is PRP better than hyaluronic acid? I would say in general, that's true. With the caveat of, it depends on how much knee bone bruising there is. So. 
there are different types of knee bone. What, what the patient is, what the person is talking about here is, hey, if you look at my MRI, you can see some increased fluid in my bone. That's a bruise. Is that bruise there because the bone was injured? Is that bruise there because the cartilage is thinned and now it's, it's being traumatized repetitively? We attack, we attack those problems a little bit differently. One of the, um, uh, Joy asks, uh, do we actually inject PRP intraosseous? Yes, there are studies that show that if you inject PRP into that bone bruise area, uh, that you can actually improve the quality of the bone. Uh, and then, um, uh, but then there's some newer data that is intriguing to me where we are, um, uh, and this is off topic, but we're bringing shockwave therapy. So you're familiar with people who have kidney stones and then they use this external um, sound wave device to, to fracture the um, kidney stones. Uh, the same modalities are now being used to treat those bone bruises in the knee and in other bones. And so we're going to be exploring that in this clinic. So maybe we don't need to inject in the bone anymore. That would be great. Um, but on par, PRP is superior to hyaluronic acid for that knee osteoarthritis. Um, uh, just, just to add, Dr. Rogers, the Baker cyst is really a symptom of the problem of osteoarthritis. Yeah. Uh, it happens because there's extra fluid uh, that uh, is happening in the joint, and some of that leaks into the cyst. It's a sign that there is inflammation and pain in the joint. So once you treat the osteoarthritis, that Baker cyst will go away. Yeah, when we were young, when we were young doctors and not too smart, we were so proud of ourselves because we could stick a needle in the cyst and drain it. But then the patient would come back the next week with the cyst filled with fluid again. We realized we need to stop the osteoarthritis process. So we stopped the process with these different biologics that we inject into the knee joint. And then like Dr. Ambach said, the knee stops making that extra fluid and the cyst goes away. Uh, the cost for PRP varies depending on what we're injecting. It, um, it's, uh, runs uh, in the nation, it runs anywhere from about a thousand to two thousand dollars is sort of the national average. We charge about sixteen hundred dollars um, for uh, PRP in the knee. It's a little bit more if we're doing a more complicated case like a spine. Somebody had a question about us injecting into the spine with PRP. We can, uh, under the practice of medicine, inject PRP into the spine, specifically into the disc. Dr. Rombach has done a lecture on this. You can see on our YouTube video, I mean, our YouTube channel. Uh, we also inject PRP. Guess what? You have joints in your back, little knuckle joints. They get arthritis too. You can inject PRP into the joints in the back or even into the ligaments and tendons in the back. Um, we do not inject hyaluronic acid in the spine because it is not approved for that use. Um, we also inject PRP uh, epidurally in the spine. So kind of like when we use yeah. the epidural cortisone injection, it helps with sciatica and nerve pain. I tell everybody, whatever steroids can do, PRP does better. <laughs> <laughs> you yes. know, I injected steroids for 20 years. Now we inject PRP instead. Works better, lasts longer, it's safer. Uh, it's just not covered by insurance. That's the only downside. Um, what else do we want to tackle here, Dr. Uh, so many good questions. Any, I know. <laughs> Uh, what procedure is being used to determine the best injection cocktail for a torn meniscus and knee osteoarthritis? <clears throat> Unfortunately, when you have a knee osteoarthritis, especially when it's in the moderate to severe category, you get to start involving the meniscus because they both protect the joint. They both act as a cushion in the joint. So if the cartilage is not 100%, that meniscus starts to uh, take over that load and it, it becomes um, a degenerative or torn. So it, it's almost always that if we see moderate to severe osteoarthritis, we see meniscus there as well. So when we treat the joint, wherein we, we put all your cells in the joint, that also bathes the meniscus and helps keeping that meniscus uh, healthier. There are some studies wherein uh, PRP can be effective for meniscus tears uh, by itself. So like young athletes who uh, had traumatic um, um, event and they, they tore their meniscus. If it's a small tear, depending on where that tear is and what kind of tear it is, the PRP can help um, heal the tear in the meniscus and protect the, the healthy meniscus tissue um, as well. So it just, again, it, just depends on um, what the patient needs, what the what the uh, pathology is in the knee. Uh, but we use PRP for that. We use other cell therapies um, like uh, bone marrow derived cell therapies and uh, adipose derived uh, 
cell therapies to um, help with this problem. Yeah, and just to help you wrap your head around this for some of you folks that are new to this, in general, for the milder pathology, small tendon tears, medium-sized tendon tears, mild to moderate in the osteoarthritis, we find PRP is very helpful for those types of conditions. A lot of folks, unfortunately, wait too long. Um, we often hear folks say, I thought my knee pain was going to go away. I thought my shoulder pain was going away, it go away, and it hasn't. Or maybe they've tried a number of things and it's not working. And then we get them, you know, a year, two years, five years, 10 years down the road. And now we get the MRI and the X-ray and the ultrasound and we do our exam, all the different ways we look at the joint. And we realize this is actually a very severe type of injury. And at that point, we're going to look at something that has maybe a little bit more potency in terms of uh, its ability to suppress inflammation and promote a regenerative response. And those two tissues typically involve uh, cells from your bone marrow or cells from the adipose tissue. For those patients with more severe meniscus tears, more severe cartilage damage, more severe uh, tendon tears, uh, we'll, we'll probably be talking about, you know, if you come visit us, we'll probably talk to you about uh, bone marrow or, or adipose cells, um, which are both very easy to harvest and, and use and the effects are very good. Um, this, this field is evolving all the time. I guarantee you this time next year, we'll be saying a whole lot of different things than we're saying today. But as, as it stands, this is sort of the state of the art. Um, uh, there's a question here, a great question on rotator cuff tears, um, which is a very common problem. Um, I always tell folks, if you're 60 years old or older and you go to your high school reunion, and everybody got a free MRI, you'd see at least two thirds of them have rotator cuff tears. So the question is, you know, can we optimize the shoulder somehow? Can we optimize the motion? Can we optimize the strength? Can we optimize the function of the joint? Uh, that's where physical therapy comes in. But then when it comes to actual tissue healing, trying to heal the tendon, uh, and by the way, sewing it together doesn't really heal the tendon, just kind of holds it together. So we're not very, we're not really big fans of um, rotator cuff tendon surgery, except for very severe cases. But for the milder, moderate cases, um, PRP has been shown to be effective, not in the published literature so much, but in our own data, our own um, clinical data on our own patients that we've tracked. Uh, the results are quite good, uh, not only in terms of pain relief and improved strength and function, but also in terms of how that tendon actually looks when we image it with our ultrasound machines. So, you know, we have this ability to look at the tendon and the quality of it, and you can actually see the tears um, heal. It's just like look, watching a wound heal on your skin. And that takes anywhere from two to three months for that tear to heal. Some tears just aren't going to heal. They're just so severe. And really all we're trying to do is mitigate the pain and the inflammation associated with that tear. And so we have a number of patients that have high grade full thickness tears that we can just calm down the inflammation for a year or two years with a single treatment. Sometimes PRP can do that more often it's bone marrow tissue or um, adipose derived cells. Right, so in uh, conjunction to that, there's a question here with regards to in the case of bone and bone in the knee, could PRP indefinitely postpone the need for a knee replacement? Uh, usually severe arthritis do better with uh, cell-based therapy for bone marrow or fat uh, graft, and that can last them anywhere from two to four years. Um, PRP can help decrease inflammation uh, and act basically like a long acting cortisone into the knee without the side effects of the steroid. Um, so it can help with the pain, it can help with the inflammation. It's probably not gonna alter your arthritis or improve your arthritis. Um, but in our clinical experience and what the studies have shown, the cell-based therapies for bone marrow or fat do better with a uh, more severe type of osteoarthritis. Uh we have some people writing in here. Thank you very much for helping me. So you're welcome. I'm glad you're feeling better. Uh, the, one person asked about the cost. We don't charge $1,600 per joint. If we're doing multiple body parts, you get you know, 50% off the second part and then additional off the third part. And our um, patient coordinator can help you understand the cost of some of these things. But um, we do, we do you know, try to make it affordable and um, available to people. The... Um, uh, people often ask me, why are you so much more expensive than everybody else? And, and I answer, I say, because I've been doing it longer and do it better than anybody else in San Diego. And I'm sorry for my ego, but that's just, you know, we, we, we're aware of the, qual the standard of care out there. And we try to always be at the top of that standard. Um, 
Dr. Rogers, just a question here for you for um, CMC joint in the thumbs. Yeah, again, it goes to the, yeah. So CMC is this little joint, your thumb. All of us are gonna get arthritis in this joint. It's actually the most common joint in the body to get arthritis, although you don't hear much about it. It's called the carpal metacarpal joint, CMC for short. That joint um, is extremely problematic uh, for some people, especially when it's in their dominant hand and you use it for everything, right? For pinching, grabbing, lifting things. So um, if it's mild to moderate, PRP will work. If it's more severe, we'll probably use bone marrow. I think there's also a role for adipose derived cells, although there's some technical technical challenges that we need to overcome to make that available. But um, I'm optimistic that in the next three to four years, we'll probably have an FDA approved stem cell product that can be um, used and hopefully covered by insurance. Uh, so hang in there. In the meantime, we can buy you some time possibly with um, PRP. And of course, you know we're talking about injections we're physical medicine doctors. We also have other tools in our toolbox. We have physical therapy. We have other ways of managing pain. So um, today, I just, I don't want to, we're kind of overemphasizing the cell-based therapies because they're exciting and new and, and very effective in many cases, but understand that sometimes we have to piece it together with other types of um, care as well. So there's a question here on uh, the studies, and um, I wanted to to show you where these studies are. So if you go to our website, this is our website, um, and you go to here where it says resources, yeah. and then you go under research. So each biologic is um, um, uh, put into different sections here. So let's say you're interested in the platelet-rich plasma, you can just click on that. And all of this have links to the actual studies. And these are arranged per body region, if I'm not mistaken. So let's say you want to learn about uh, PRP injection into the disc, you can click on that link and it will send you to the uh, study itself. So lots of information in our website. There's also lots of information and videos in our YouTube channel. Um, so if you uh, missed anything or if you, want, if you have more questions about any topic, you could uh, watch the videos in our YouTube channel. Yeah, and we're, you know, a little behind on updating some of those. So we will we'll be doing a major update probably in the near future, uh, getting some more current papers in there because uh, Dr. Ambach and I together probably read about 100 papers a week. And um, it's just getting to the point where uh, it's really challenging to stay up. And we filter through the good ones and put them on the website, the ones that we think you might be most interested in. If you actually come and visit us, we can pull articles specific to your condition. I, I annoy my patients all the time by giving them original publications for them to go home and read so they can understand what we're, you know, what we're talking about and how it may help them. Um, all right, we, we've got time for a couple more questions, Dr. Oh, Rogers. Yeah, I see two I'm gonna tackle. One is, um, okay. Uh, hey, I'm near or older than 60 years old. Do I still have stem cells in my body? Yes, as long as you are living and breathing, you have stem cells in your body. It is your natural toolkit. Every time you cut yourself shaving, every time you drop something on your toe, every time you hurt yourself or get sick, those stem cells are what keeps you alive. So yeah, you're full of them. It's true that as we get older, the number of cells, which is already very low in the bone marrow, continues to diminish significantly after age 50. Fortunately, however, in our fat, and most of us are lucky enough to have some fat, um, that number does not seem to drop as much. So, uh, and by the way, those cells are potent, meaning they have the ability to do what we ask them to do. All the time people ask me, I'm 80 years old, can, can stem cell therapy help me? what we're calling stem cell therapy, taking cells. Um, my favorite paper is from uh, our friend, Dr. Hernigau, an orthopedic surgeon in Paris, France. And he did a nice study on octogenarians where he was able to demonstrate a high success rate in treating knee osteoarthritis using the patient's own bone marrow cells. Uh, so in my opinion, bone marrow cells are not as um, uh, effective as tre at treating osteoarthritis as fat derived cells are. Nonetheless, he was able to show efficacy in octogenarians. So we have good clinical data for that. So we have uh, uh, questions here regarding clinical trials that we do. Um, and uh, some are willing participants. 
if we do have a clinical trial, uh, we will send uh, an email blast. We'll uh, uh, post it in our websites, in our YouTube channel. Uh, surely we'll find a way to get that information to you so that you can participate in our clinical trials. Um, there, we will uh, be most likely doing a webinar on shockwave therapy so that you can get more educated on that uh, new modality that we will be adding to our clinic. Um, also more questions on the insurance and the payment and um, our uh, staff will give you more information, detailed information about payment plans and cost. Uh, Dr. Rogers is going to uh, talk to you about cost. When you uh, are evaluating in the clinic, we do accept PPO insurance, Medicare insurance. So all your consultation, the ultrasound, the imaging studies, all of those are covered by insurance. The only things that, that are not covered by insurance are the cell therapies, which are uh, cash-based. So, um, so yeah, thank you very much for your time. That hour just flew by really quickly. We're glad to be doing this again and expect us to be doing this at least once a month. Um, and we will be alternating a webinar and a Q&A uh, a, a series, which we call Ask the Docs, wherein we go live on Facebook so that we can um, have more people uh, join us and ask uh, questions regarding our topic. Thank you so much for joining us. Till uh, next time. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you.